Hello, students. My name is Dr. Cozart, and I would like to welcome you to Marriage and Family Counseling. I hope you have uh, prepared for this course and you're ready to get underway. As we begin our course together, I would like to share with you just a, a few comments about the importance of marriage and family therapy, survey course outcomes, and consider how marriage and family um, can be seen from the Christian worldview. As we start here, the importance, the importance of marriage and family therapy, I, I don't think it can be emphasized too much. Uh, we all know how marriage and family forms a, a very critical part of the history of man and society. Marriage and family provide protection, relationships, uh, a secure setting for children. It provides uh, companionship and old age. All of these things are essential in order for society to operate uh, with any degree of success. And we as marriage and family therapists uh, play this vital role of assisting uh, couples and their kids um, to achieve a, a certain level of satisfaction and happiness in life. Those of us who counsel in this area should not see it merely as a, a vocation, as a job, uh, just another session, maybe another counseling fee. Uh, that we receive, but rather uh, a vital role in society uh, through which we serve humanity, we serve mankind. Uh, because of this, uh, a course uh, such as Marriage and Family is something of the utmost importance. For many of us, we will be completing 20 or so courses uh, for our degree, depending on what our major is. And for many of us, if we don't major in marriage and family therapy, especially, this will be our only in-depth exposure to marriage and family counseling. Uh, certainly, we're going to receive indirect um, exposure in some other classes that we take, but nothing quite as intense and in-depth as this course. So we want to make the most of it and, and be aware that these things we're, that we are covering will, in, in large part, uh, determine how well we will be able to uh, counsel, especially in our early months and years of our profession. That's the importance of marriage and family therapy. Now I'd like to talk about the course outcomes. We have here um, seven. The first one is we want to analyze the history of marriage and family counseling, theories of marriage and family development across the lifespan, models of counseling, and especially the system's approach to conceptual, conceptualizing marriage and family clients, what we mean by the systems approach is we're going to realize that marriage and family problems are, are not isolated often to one individual uh, in an isolated point of time uh, in the history of a family, but rather um, there are these systemic or these underlying um, relationships um, in a family, either between the couple or the couple and the children, or the family and the extended family beyond, including the history leading up to the difficulties. So we want to understand that um, as clinicians, and that's one of our, our first outcomes here. The second outcome is we want to practice assessments case conceptualization techniques and treatments. Um, the first outcome is more about history and, and context, 
The second outcome is about how we actually look at a problem, um, measure it through assessments, put together um, a, a case, including techniques, and then employ those techniques and treatments um, for a family or a couple. Third outcome is we want to discover ethically and culturally relevant strategies for marriage and family counseling. Once we case conceptualize and understand the difficulty, begin to employ these treatments, what kind of treatments are we going to use? There's a wide array of strategies and we wanna be aware of those and, and when to employ them, when would be the best times to introduce certain strategies given the presenting problems. The next, next course outcome, number four, is evaluate the impact of heritage, attitudes, beliefs, understandings, and acculturated experiences on marriage and family counseling. What is meant by this is we want to be aware of the differences in our clients in terms of race, culture, heritage, their background. And we realize that uh, many of our approaches, even the therapeutic alliance, um, matters of techniques and strategies, uh, anticipated outcomes, um, oftentimes have to be calibrated in terms of the types of clients that we have in terms of race, heritage, attitudes, beliefs, all these things that are listed. Our fifth outcome is to integrate contextual dimensions of marriage and family therapy. Um, different types of families, whether they're single parents, blended families, people who come to us with um, various ideas of humans, about human sexuality, um, the age of the clients, intergenerational influences, of course, crisis and trauma, addiction and violence, uh, problems associated with, with employment, socioeconomic status, gender roles, physical and mental health, and, and also medications. All of these things um, form the prism through which um, we understand the difficulties of the couple and family and how to best address them. We want to touch on these matters uh, in, in this course. And then number six, we want to recognize the importance of the marriage and family certification, licensure, accreditation practices, standards and specialty areas professional counseling organizations, legal issues, um, and counselor involvement in public policy. The point here is we uh, anticipate becoming professionals um, as counselors, as psychologists, perhaps even as marriage and family therapists. What does that look like in terms of our profession? What should we look at in terms of certification, licensure, accreditation? How can we be involved to promote our profession? And then finally, the seventh course out outcome is to summarize biblical, theological, and philosophical assumptions about marriage and family uh, therapy. And how do we demonstrate that um, in, in the use of counseling when it comes to the Christian worldview. Of course, we approach marriage and family therapy from the standpoint of the Christian worldview. What does that look like? How is that implemented? The course texts have Christian volumes and what would be considered secular volumes. And we intentionally chose these texts so that we have a blend 
of Christian and secular um, information um, when it comes to being a marriage and, and family uh, clinician. We do this so that we can uh, serve our clientele uh, in the best possible way. And if our clients are Christians or inclined to receive a Christian, the Christian message or information, we want to be prepared for that. That brings us to our third, third main item uh, for this video, and it, it is the marriage and family um, idea from a Christian worldview. I have for you here eight points about the Christian worldview in terms of marriage and family. Uh, eight points, eight principles. And I base them on, first of all, scripture. This opening slide has um, a long list of Bible passages that I encourage you at some point to read over and consider and study. And these become the basis for these eight points that I want to share with you. The first one is that marriage is an option, not an obligation. Uh, singleness may be preferred. Sometimes in our culture or the cultures in which we find our, ourselves, marriage seems to be an obligation. It seems to be uh, placed upon people as a uh, pressure of some sort. But in the Bible, marriage is not necessarily something that all people uh, need to, to uh, engage themselves in, but rather singleness might be the preferred option. The Apostle Paul, Jesus, others um, were single, and they found that by being single, they were uh, more able to serve God uh, in their particular areas of life. And so as we start off, we want to understand this as something that's not for everyone. And that if people choose to be single, we exalt that, we respect that, we honor that, and don't want to pressure them to undertake an obligation or a way of life uh, for which they're not well suited. The second point is that marriage and family are meant to glorify God. From the Christian point of view, all that we do is for the glory of God. I list here a couple of passages, one from Isaiah, one from 1 Corinthians, which speak about this important doxological aspect to marriage and family. God decreed that all that is done should be for God's glory. And so fundamentally, we would like to guide people to, to see that their marriage and family is more than just about two people coming together and, and, and signing some sort of governmental contract, or for that matter, religious contract, covenantal contract, but rather the, the, the aspirations and the horizon for marriage and family rise much higher. The idea of marriage and family is that we join with others in marriage and family to honor and to glorify God because bringing him glory is the greatest thing that human beings can do. And I believe the reason uh, for which God made the creation. We see here that in Genesis chapter one, that God made man in his image and gave him uh, these, these uh, uh, different obligations and responsibilities to rule over the world. Uh, by being made in God's image, people were given the ability to relate to God and honor God and to manage his creation. And so he actually gives husbands and wives and, and, and children 
this ability to glorify him and honor him um, in their relationships. The third thing about uh, marriage and family is that marriage was designed by God to bring good to married couples uh, and their children. Um, the glory of God point two there and the good of man point three here are like two sides to a coin. When a couple and their kids seek to glorify God and honor him and, and follow his guidance for a successful marriage and family, that in turn brings good to them. To glorify God is to seek his best for ourselves. In Genesis chapter 2, we're told that God made a helper for the first man, for Adam. He did this so that this uh, primal couple, this first couple, Adam and Eve, uh, could not only honor him and respect him and give him glory, but so that they could help each other and have children. There was this mutual benefit that came about when God made them not only to glorify him, but to join together in the journey of life. It's important to remember that this was true before the fall of mankind, but it is especially important following the fall in Genesis chapter three. Um, after the six days of creation, the world and humanity, they were ideal. The ideal environment, ideal people, everything was great. The couple lived in harmony and happiness um, in the Garden of Eden. But after the fall, the world uh, was broken. People were broken. But life wasn't over. God enjoined uh, the couple uh, we might say eventually the family with Cain, Abel, and, and Seth, the children of Adam and Eve, uh, to still join him in bringing order and usefulness to the fallen world. Marriage and family are a part of this post-fall uh, undertaking. And through, I believe, successful and God honoring uh, marriages, we bring a certain order to this world. We bring a certain usefulness and a certain satisfaction to those who engage in it. This brings us to our fourth principle from the Christian worldview about marriage and family. And it is that marriage is a vibrant and instructive metaphor in the Bible. A metaphor is a symbol. It's a figure. Um, it speaks of a greater reality. Marriage, we find in the Bible, instructs us about God, about the church, and about our relationship with God and the church. In the Old Testament, we see that the metaphor of marriage um, is used for God and his bride, Israel. In the New Testament, the metaphor is used for the relationship between Christ and the church. And it's not just all positive. It also includes the realities of, of this fallen world in terms of difficulty, betrayal, and loss. But I pointed out here, and I bring you this point in order to, to speak about the grandeur of marriage and family, the potential of marriage and family that God uses it to speak about himself, to speak about Christ, and that the stakes are, are terribly high when it comes to marriage and family, where people can experience some of the greatest joys and happinesses, happiness in life, but also um, some of the worst difficulties and um, um, ongoing problems that are that are hard to calculate. We all know that in dealing with those with marriage and family problems. 
The fifth principle is marriage is between one man and one woman, a, a fundamental concept um, in the Bible from the very beginning. Um, this was the instruction, and this was the pattern. Uh, people maintain their biological gender rather than their identified gender. Marriage was was never between uh, same gender couples. The arguments for one man, one woman marriage can be sustained um, through both the Old and New Testaments and through biblical and natural law. This is one of the basic truths and guides that we see in the Bible for marriage and family. Uh, some may ask, how does this biblical pattern comport with repeated instances of polygamy in the Old Testament more than uh, one wife? And the answer to that is that the description of behaviors in the Bible, like those who had more than, than one wife, do not endorse or prescribe those behaviors. A description in scripture does not necessarily mean a prescription or something that should be uh, followed. The sixth principle is that success in Christian marriage and family depend on several factors. So far in these first five points, we've seen the, the theoretical ideal. But how do we actually do this? It depends on certain factors. For example, do both partners demonstrate a genuine Christian faith? Do they seek to live out that faith in the context of marriage and family? It's one thing to see these principles and truths in the Bible, but are those in the marriage, in the family, willing to put these into practice? Several biblical passages encourage married couples to love each other and their children in the context of their faith. So the Christian worldview is not simply something that is a, an aside in a person's life or something they employ at certain holidays or on Sunday mornings or at other times, but rather it's an all-encompassing vision uh, about the way a person relates to other people, including their partner, including their children, including their parents. And so the Christian faith guides everything they do with each other in the marriage and family. When couples and children demonstrate this faith, there's a greater likelihood of satisfaction and happiness. I believe this passage, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, capture the kind of character qualities needed that is promoted in a Christian marriage. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I can only imagine the difference that takes place in a marriage. It's founded on um, the Christian worldview and employs um, these expectations for the marriage. Um, the seventh principle is ideally marriage is a lifelong commitment. The Bible teaches the permanency of marriage. The Bible provides a broad array of ethical teachings that are to guide the marriage, as we just stated, in terms of factors that lead to success. But we also want to point out that there are times when marriages fail, when they're destructive. And the Bible provides, um, I believe, a, a merciful way of, of reducing or, or terminating such a relationship, uh, and that is in divorce. But even if the grounds of divorce exist, it should not be considered automatic. It should not be encouraged. It should not be considered as the preferred solution. But when all else fails, 
then God allows it. But each situation, each couple should be um, looked at carefully, carefully considered. And if the biblical grounds for divorce exist, then um, the possibility or perhaps the probability should be weighed. The final uh, principle um, having to do with the Christian worldview and marriage is that marriage can be enjoyed whether or not the marriage partners are Christians. In the Bible, this is considered common grace and is distinct from efficacious grace. Common grace was God's way of preserving humanity despite the fall through various sustaining institutions in society, regardless of a person's faith. And so we as clinicians want to be aware that some may choose not to embrace the Christian faith. And if this is the case, then God in his um, grace and mercy provides a certain degree of happiness when to some degree his principles are followed. So these eight principles, marriage is an option, not an obligation. Marriage and family are meant to glorify God. Marriage brings about good to couples and kids. Marriage is a vibrant and instructive metaphor. Uh, it is between one woman and one man. Success depends on several factors. It should be an ideal commitment, but there are provisions for divorce. And then finally, marriage can be enjoyed whether or not the marriage partners are Christians. As we wrap up our time on this video, some may wonder about an emphasis um, on the Christian worldview and how this impacts the therapist who does not share the view, nor perhaps clients who are not of the Christian persuasion. I, I believe there's an easy answer to that, which goes back to a fundamental biblical truth and a principle rooted in Christian um, um, ethics and counseling ethics, and that is autonomy. Um, autonomy means allowing clients to make their own choices about treatment and options. It's also taught in the Bible. The idea of being made in the image of God means that God has free will, and to some degree, uh, human beings have free will. So if God champions free will, um, those of us who are Christians should champion, champion it as well. If a therapist um, chooses not to embrace the Christian uh, worldview, or if a client chooses not to embrace the Christian worldview, our hope is that common grace will cover them and they will be blessed. One of the greatest compliments God afforded mankind was the dignity of causality, uh, even if those choices are not good ones. So Christian marriage and family therapists um, and their clients have this same option. God was pleased to grant autonomy to Christian therapists and to clients, and we should as well. It has been a delight to uh, share with you uh, on this video. We talked about the importance of a class such as this and how it fits into the curriculum. We've talked about our seven course outcomes. And also we looked at a general introduction to um, a Christian worldview concerning marriage and family therapy. I hope you're looking forward uh, to your time in this class and I hope it goes well with you and you succeed. <music>